Welcome. Thank you for coming out. I am Dan Smith, the director of the Political Economy Research Institute here at Middle Tennessee State University. The Political Economy Research Institute is a privately funded, student-centered initiative with a mission of engaging undergraduate and graduate students in research with faculty that advances our understanding of the market economy and its impact on the well-being of society um, and economic well-being. Uh, I have a short video about the Political Economy Research Institute that I want to show you before we begin. If you can cue the video uh, for the IT folks. Thank you. The Political Economy Research Institute is a privately funded, student-centered initiative with the mission of engaging students with faculty in research and teaching that advances our understanding of a market economy and its impact on the well-being of society. The primary way we achieve this is by working with PhD students. These PhD students go on to be scholars that do productive cutting edge research that advances our understanding of a market economy and its impact on the well-being of society. These PhD students, more importantly, become teachers in the classroom teaching thousands of students sound economics over the course of their careers. Here at Perry, we have tremendous support from the faculty and from students. Faculty will always look into our papers and help us develop our research questions and the students will always question our research, question our methodologies and our conclusions and push us to be better and challenge our initial thoughts. And I think this combination of support and challenges is what makes Perry uh, an incredible resource for any PhD in economics student. I thought that my research really fit in well with the Perry um, because it all kind of centers around public choice, which is really what MTSU and the Perry are known for because of the previous contributions of Jim Buchanan. And, you know, with the Perry, I, I'm grateful that they've given me the opportunity to pursue um, my further academic goals because a lot of people like me with physical disabilities and even mental disabilities just don't get the opportunity to do so. And for that, I am eternally grateful. It has been an amazing journey. I've learned so much. It was wonderful working with all these wonderful fellows from all walks of life. We're all different colors, different mother tongues, different everything. And we work together, just we blend like an amazing team. Here you're allowed and encouraged to think out of the box. Another benefit of being at Perry and being at Middle Tennessee State is that I get to interact with students, uh, especially students who have never taken economics before. And so in my principal classes, I try to transmit to them the passion for economics. And that's led to incredible outcomes in terms of the participation of the students and the demand of students for other economics classes and the growth of our major. And it's been incredible to see the program grow in even just the two years that I've been here. I learned about Perry when I was pursuing a master's program in finance here at MTSU. I found how the resources and faculty members at Perry can help me in my research. So I was excited when I was offered Ferry Fellowship. After graduation, I would return to Nigeria to continue my career with the Central Bank of Nigeria. With my PhD in economics, I look forward to playing a vital role in the Nigerian pension industry. The thing that I really like about the Perry is the breadth of, of viewpoints and expertise. What that means is that the Perry is really good at finding innovative solutions to problems that have plagued economics, political economy, and, and academia in general for a long time. So we don't solve these problems by doing the same thing over and over again. And so the breadth of expertise, uh, the different viewpoints, is really, really valuable. Like I have an art history degree, right? And so I think that helps me have a slightly different viewpoint. And I learn a lot from the students. And the thing that I think I'm able to bring to the table is helping students figure out what they're really good at saying, giving them really, really cohesive ways of doing that. Right? So the students, I think, come here with their expertise, with their viewpoints. And I think what, what the faculty we really focus on is finding ways to get the best out of them while maintaining their point of view and their voice. The experience I've had with the Perry Institute has just been wonderful in many respects. And if there are any 
practitioners or researchers who are looking for an opportunity to engage in the research, ask the really hard questions from an open perspective. If there are students who are interested in tackling the problem of criminal justice reform or are interested just in the topic generally, and finally, if there's anyone looking to contribute uh, to this effort, we would be very happy to talk with you, uh, to have you on our campus as a student or a speaker, to help you answer the questions within your institution or agency that are really challenging to ask and take a collaborative approach to really come to a firm conclusion. Our students explore the relationship between economic freedom and economic growth. There is a robust and consistent relationship between those countries that have a deep appreciation for economic freedom those people that live in the most economically free countries can expect to live 20 years longer than those that live in the least economically free countries. 20 years is a difference between knowing your grandchildren and not knowing your grandchildren. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Ming Wang. Dr. Ming Wang is a world-renowned laser eye surgeon, philanthropist, and co-founder of the nonprofit Common Ground Network. As a teenager, Ming fought valiantly to escape China's cultural revolution, during which millions of innocent youth were deported to remote areas to face a life sentence of hard labor and poverty. He came to America with only $50 in, uh, and earned two doctorate degrees, one in laser physics and one in medicine, and it graduated with the higher, highest honors from Harvard Medical School and MIT. The amni amniotic membrane contact lens, which Dr. Main has invented, has been used by tens of thousands of eye doctors throughout the world in nearly every nation, and millions have had their eyesight restored. The Wang Foundation for Sight Restoration has helped patients from over 40 states in the U.S. and 55 countries with all sight restoration surgeries performed free of charge. Dr. Wang was named the Kiwanis Nashvillian of the Year for his lifelong dedication to help blind, orphaned children from around the world. The film Sight is based on Dr. Wang's autobiography from Darkness to Sight and co-stars Greg Kinnar. His lecture tonight will be Seeking Common Ground in U.S. and China Trade. The lecture is part of our Dr. Ming Wang's Cosmopolitan Initiative lecture series, generously funded by Dr. Ming Wang. Thank you, Professor Smith. Good evening. I'm really to, uh, happy to see many friends and old and new friends. Tonight, I would like to explore a very important question in the setting of uh, one of the great colleges in Tennessee, in this part of the country. I had the opportunity to tour the MTSU Chinese Music Institute with Professor Mei Han, the director. Professor sitting somewhere here. And um, realized that in, it's a, in a setting like this, we get to explore the issues in our lives around the world in a free environment that we all get to speak our mind, share our thought, and uh, we all can separate positions from person. We may not agree with each other, but we all can discuss civilly and openly. Tonight, I would like to bring out the important issue about America and China. First of all, you may have questions. You say, Dr. Wang, why do you need to understand about China? What is it? Isn't it China is one of the, actually the number one rivals of the United States, competing in nearly every aspect? Is it China our enemy? Is, is there any, what's the value of improving relationship between China and United States? I want to get this question out of the way because otherwise we will be sitting here without realizing what's the value of the question we're trying to explore tonight. I think it's important to study China for several reasons. Number one, humanistically, at the end of the day, we are human beings. We have the shared humanity. Political ideology may be different. History, culture may be different. But as human beings, we are 
is our love and one peace and security. People in China, just as just like people in America or any other countries, we all have a shared human desire. Based on humanity, the shared humanity on this spaceship Earth, we need to understand each other to realize that at the end we have so much more in common than what we are different as human beings. Second reason, China is world's second largest economy. GDP of China today is two thirds of the United States. Recent Russian invasion of Ukraine. Of course, militarily, Russia is very powerful, as we know. But the size of Russian economy is only 10% of Chinese economy. Not only China is the second largest economy in the world today, two thirds of the United States, and not only that, it is positioned to surpass the United States in about 10 years, become the largest economy, but also among the $25 trillion national debt we owe, to the rest of the world. Do you know we owe the most, which country we owe the most about United States national debt? China, nearly 15%. We, yes, we explore, uh, export tremendous amount of product to China, but we buy a lot more. A, a company cannot survive without being able to sell. A country cannot survive without being able to sell your product. We need to be able to sell back to China what we have to offer as a country. Do you know what's the first step in selling a product? Any business you run is do you understand your customers? Then you say, Ming, what's the evidence that we are not understanding China as much as China understands us? I'll give you one evidence. For every 10,000 Chinese who can speak reasonable level of English today, you cannot find one American who can speak comparable level of Chinese. The number of people in China who can speak basic level of English has just surpassed the entire United States population. That's the complacency I'm talking about. That's lack of curiosity that I'm talking about. So to learn about China is not just the right thing to do as a part of the human race, to learn about other culture and people, but it's an economic necessity for America. So it is for these two reasons particularly in light of recent events. Russia is attacking Ukraine. People in Ukraine is fighting for their very right to even exist. In a world that is politically represented by, on one hand, democracies, one hand, authoritarian government, there's a question now, which way is better way of living? Democracy or autocracy? From our perspective, even from our own perspective as a democratic country, we don't want authoritarian government in the world to take control of the world. Do you want to see a strong alliance of Russia and China? The best way, even on the political front, to fight advers adversaries is to divide the enemies. It's stupid for us not to recognize the opportunity to improve relationships with countries like China. So they put China this way, rather than letting China go the other way 
to form strong alliances with another authoritative government, which is Russia. So it is in these three reasons we need to learn about China. So today I will specifically explore what do we have in common. A bit about where I came from, why I'm interested in this topic. I grew up in China during a time called Cultural Revolution, where government shut down all universities and colleges of an entire country in 1966 and forcefully deported every high school graduate throughout China to some of the poorest part of the country and condemn each one of us a life sentence of hard labor and poverty. Over 10 years of Cultural Revolution, by shutting down all universities and colleges of entire China for that 10 years, they sent away to labor camp 20 million high school graduates for life. 1974, I was 14 years old. I grew up in a very poor family. To give you a sense how poor we were, the combined salaries of my parents every month were only $15 every month. Mom and dad always said, study hard, study hard. Education was the only way to get out of poverty. So I studied really hard. So 1974, I finished my ninth grade at age 14. I was a straight A student. I was looking forward to attending 10th grade and beyond when the deportation order came down to me. Just like 20 million others, I will be sent away to labor camp for life. In order to escape this devastating fate of being sent away to labor camp for life, I found out that if I could play a music instrument, in this case, a Chinese violin, arhu, okay, repeat after me, arhu, one more time, arhu, very good, you all can speak Chinese now. If I could play the instrument or if I could dance, I might be to get into what they call communist song and dance propaganda troupe. If I could do that, I might be to avoid being sent away to labor camps by being allowed to stay in the cities because government still needed musicians and dancers in the cities for its song and dance propaganda troupe. Then something happened. My little scheme of avoid being sent away to labor camp by playing music instrument got discovered by the government. They realized that I was playing music instrument, learning dancing with an ulterior motive, really not for music per se, but to avoid being sent away to labor camp. So they stopped my music and dancing practice. It's interesting that sometimes friends in this country today say, oh, being so nice, you have a hobby, you can play instrument, you can dance. It must be nice to have these hobbies. You know what I say? I didn't learn these as hobbies. I learned it to survive. So I tried everything, all failed. My fate was going to be sent away to labor camp for life, just like 20 million others. Now remember, for life. When I was about to be actually sent away, I got lucky. 1976, I was four, 17, the dictator died. So all of a sudden, China woke up, realizing what a tragic mistake it has made by having shut down all universities and colleges for 10 years, by having sent away to labor camp for life, 20 million high school graduates. So they stopped the Cultural Revolution, reopened all the colleges. And mom and dad came home one day, they said, come over here. You may be able to go back to school. I thought I would never be able to hear, do that ever in my lifetime. I said, really? Mom said, yes, tomorrow. I said, should I go back to ninth grade? Because three years ago, I was 14. I got kicked out of school after ninth grade. In the last three years, I've been playing music, learning dancing. I was out of school. So now there's a chance to go back to, to avoid labor camp. So now there's a chance to go back to school. Should I go back to ninth? Guess what my dad said? He said, no, higher. I said, 10th? He said, no, higher. I said, 11th? He said, no, higher. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, dad. You want me to go back to school tomorrow, but you want me to jump three years ahead overnight from ninth to 12th. Have you never studied 10th, 11th, 12th? He said, yes. I said, why? I said, he said, only 12th graders are allowed to participate in the college entrance exam. The first college 
entrance exam in China in 10 years. Because the university college was shut down for 10 years. I said that even if it's somehow magically I become a 12th grader overnight <laughs> tomorrow, having never studied 10th, 11th, 12th, what's my chance of getting to college? What percent of the 12th graders could get in? 1976. He said about 1%. I said, you guys are crazy. Mom said, we're not crazy. She asked, how long did the government shut down colleges? I said, 10 years, from 1966 to 1976. She said, OK. We're in, 19, we're in 1976, all right. They did reopen all the colleges, all right. But there's a guarantee. They will not shut down college again next year for another 10 years. So I knew I had to do it. I had to do the nearly impossible. So I got so stressed out. How could I do that? I have to try to get into college somehow. And mom and dad said, we're going to help you. So during daytime, they were working very hard. At night, they borrowed some old review questions. But we were so poor that, remember, the combined salaries of my parents every month were only $15. So mom and dad found, found little pieces of paper throughout the house, hand copied those review questions onto these little pieces of papers. And every night, drilled me with these questions containing those review questions. They made me study 19, 20, 21 hours a day. I almost killed myself studying. My autobiography from Darkness to Sight, which you have on your table, talk about that. When I'm eventually made to the examination building on the day of the exam, I almost collapsed from exhaustion. I did barely get into college, all right, but I did not want to have anything to do with the dictators anymore. I suffered enough. So 1982, with $50 borrowed from a visiting American professor with a student visa, with a Chinese English dictionary. I was dropped at National Airport, Washington, DC. With that $50, knowing no one in this country could hardly speak in English, even though I was nearly penniless, but I was happy. Why? I had the freedom. I had the good fortune of attending some of the wonderful schools in this country since then. I decided to be a good laser eye surgeon. So I figured I need to study both medicine and laser technology. So I got my first doctor degree in laser physics and I went on to get a second doctor degree in medicine. I performed over 55,000 laser vision procedures, including on over 4,000 doctors. These are, for example, the textbooks that I published over the years in cataract and LASIK surgery fields. These are the textbooks that translated into Chinese. You know the Chinese violin, Erhu, that I played during Cultural Revolution to Escape Labor Camp has truly become a hobby. Even dancing that I learned during Cultural Revolution to Escape Labor Camp has become a hobby as well. We have a foundation with all the doctors. We donate our services. And once a year, we used to have a foundation of an event, a ball, a gala to raise money to help people see. How would you call that ball? Eyeball. <laughs> eyeball is a spectacularly beautiful event. When you come to Eyeball, you see all the beautiful dancing that reminds you how precious our sight is as human beings. Because without sight, we cannot see all the beautiful things in our lives. Therefore, how much we need to help those who have lost sight. Our current, I met then President Ronald Reagan many years ago, and he talked about common ground. So I've been thinking, how can we find a common ground? Common ground not only domestically, between a cross-political aisle or racial divide. As you know, our country has become increasingly fixated on differences rather than appreciating what we all have in common as fellow Americans. We are so unprecedentedly unwilling to seek common ground. COVID has revealed even bigger virus in us. That's the virus of polarization. This increased fixation on differences rather than appreciating what we all have in common as fellow Americans. When we meet someone who is on the other side of the political spectrum, 
or another side, another different race, a different ethnicity, we tend not to be able to dialogue and work together. You know what America represents? Second day I landed in this country. Um, an American friend took me to a Chinese restaurant. It was funny, I had no money, so he treated me. And by the way, it was first time I saw fortune cookie in my life. And he said, isn't it a Chinese ancient tradition? I said, i never seen one of those. He said, didn't you just come from China? I said, yes. Then I opened the fortune cookie. I saw a little, little piece of paper, a little white saying. He said, hey, that, 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 that was written by Confucius. And I go, I didn't know Confucius knew English. <laughs> so he told me, he said, Ming, what does America represent? Why America has become a country that can attract people from all over the world? You know we are so polar why we are so polarized as, as Americans today? We are so unprecedented, unwilling to walk people from the other side of the political spectrum or racial divide. Why is that? I think it's because we have forgot our blessing. We forgot how blessed we are to be able to live in America. People from around the world often put their lives on the line so they can get to the other side. Think about Ukrainian people. They're fighting for their very right to exist. Think about Afghanistan. The, several months ago, airplane was taking off. One guy was hanging on the wheel, fell in the midair to his death. Why people put so much on the line so they can get to the other side? What's on the other side? An opportunity to live in America. But living here, we're kind of taking for granted. What's the evidence we have taken for granted? Our freedom? It's because we are so unwilling to see common ground. It's like husband and wife. You don't appreciate marriage. You always look for differences. But if you truly appreciate what you have, you will turn around and look for common ground. So it's a symptom. The polarization is a symptom of lack of appreciation of what we have in America. So my friend, American friend, the second day I arrived in this country, he said, what does American represent? You know what, truly what the essence of America is? I said, tell me. What he told me, I will never forget. He said, Ming, remember this. America represents the spirit behind this saying. I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend to my death your right to say it. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? Aren't we all so blessed to be able to live in the country? But yet, human nature is that when we always have freedom, we take for granted. And the symptom of this taking for grantedness is the unprecedented polarization in America, the unprecedented unwillingness to work across the aisle. I've been bothered by this polarization for many years, and friends say, oh, why are you so polarized? Why are you so motivated to find common ground within America or internationally between, say, United States and China? Why are you so motivated to overcome the polarization to help us to do that? My answer is very simple. I'm so motivated because I've been there. I've suffered through extreme form of polarization, which is dictatorship. America, let's don't go there. So over the years, I've been thinking, how can we find a common ground? My pastor is Dr. Rice Brooks, Dr. Ron Lewis from New York. And they, Dr. Rice Brooks and Dr. Ron Lewis are the leaders of the Every Nation Ministry with churches in 82 nations. Dr. Brooks and I, two years ago, as the pandemic was about to engulf the United States, I was really worried that we may not be able to deal with this pandemic effectively. We have one of the best healthcare systems in the world and we have money, but we may not be able to deal with the pandemic as effectively. Why? Because if we allow the polarization if we allow a political polarization of a medical issue, that will paralyze our educational process of the virus, will confuse the public, not knowing what's the right information. If we allow the interest of parties over the interest of nation, we are gonna suffer. 
Two years later, unfortunately, I was turned out to be right. United States has 4% U.S. world population, 25% of the death. It, this should never happen in a country with one of the best healthcare systems. Why is that? It's because of the political polarization of a medical issue. Last time I checked, the virus doesn't care. You're blue or red, it will infect you anyway. So how do we find, help us find the common ground? We have established through two years of study, we have established this common ground seeking steps, a methodology, the starting point. As see common ground, you got to be able to see it because if you're not unwilling to see the common ground between black and white or Latino, Asians or Republic or Democrats or China, United States, if you're unwilling to see, you're not gonna get. Second, trade places. I, over the years I learned that the best way to be your good laser eye surgeon is to speak your language. You know, so many times you've seen a doctor that walked in, that will give a medical job and walked out. I said, doc, I don't understand what you just said. Do you really, are you really connecting to me, my feeling, my vision problems? And I learned that the best way to communicate is to speak the language of the listener. Empathy. When you meet with someone with different opinions rather than yelling and shouting, can we alternatively try a different way? Apply the salt principle that Dr. Rice books always talk about. S, start a conversation. A, ask a question. L, listen, and then and only then, talk. Persevere. If it's the right thing to do, there's a price to pay. And see common ground. Christ's life, Christ's life is what inspired us to formulate this common ground seeking steps. We actually published common ground Bible study that at least for Christians, that is God's calling for us to see common ground and how to see common ground, but also for other religion and faith, whether you're Islam or Buddhism or, or people with no religion, I think is the basic humanity calls us to see common ground. We have the shared humanity on the spaceship Earth. Common ground is intersection. Doesn't matter which direction you come from, when you get the intersection, you obey the same set of rules. Common ground is cruise ship. Doesn't matter what country you're from, you get on the cruise ship, you obey the same, same set of rules. And common ground is a sports game. Whether you're black or white, or Latino, Asian, when you put the same sports jersey, whether you are Christians or uh, Muslim or Buddhist or people um, who don't believe anything, but when we put the sports jersey, we all have the sh shared mission to play for the same game. I want to just... Um, show you a few examples, then I'm going to talk about extensive about China. Examples of, uh, so common ground can be found. With different people, you can find different common ground. With different people, you can find different common ground. Eight years ago, I co-founded Tennessee Immigrant Minority Business Group. It consists of Blacks, Latinos, African American, businessmen and women. Our common ground there is to our sheer interest to help each other in business and our love for this country. At our foundation, we have doctors from around the world speaking different languages. Our common ground is to help blind orphan children. To date, our foundation help patients from over 50 states, 40 states, and 55 countries. With all side restoration surgery performed, free of charge. Here you see the photo of Kajol. Kajol, we, the foundation discovered her many years ago when she was five in Calcutta, India. She was orphaned. When she was sleeping one night, her stepmother poured acid into her eyes, trying to make Kajal a blind child singer who would get more money from tourists. Kajal was maliciously blinded as such, then she was found to have no talent of singing. So Kajal was abandoned in the train station near Calcutta, India. That's how our foundation helped her. The film site is Kajal's remarkable journey from darkness to light. So that's our common ground, the foundation. It doesn't matter what language your country from, we all love blind orphan children. People think science and faith have no common ground. We're in the university setting, right? But I realize that science is the foundation and the belief, what you believe, you know, if a Christian, you believe in Christian faith, if it's Muslim or Buddhist, and to have a belief, to have a sense that we have a mission a task beyond ourselves. 
give you a sense of purpose. Many years ago, I wanted to do research to help elderly patients to see. And I've realized I have to use this uh, stem cell and the fetal tissue. I didn't want to hurt the baby, so I got, I got stuck. I want to help the elderly, but I did not want to do fetal research, stem cell research. People say science and faith, moral, ethical, faith principles have no common ground. Fortunately, I did not give up. I persisted, persisted, and 20, for 20 years. And the film site talk about that. Eventually, I came across this piece of tissue, placenta, and I got placenta donated by mothers after giving birth to a child. And I developed a technique to make into an amniotic membrane placenta contact lens. Put this youthful healing placenta contact lens onto older patients' eyes. It's a way to do fetal research without hurting a baby. Science and faith have come. Today, the amniotic membrane contact lens has been used by eye doctors, tens of thousands of eye doctors throughout the world, and millions of patients have their eyesight restored. I'm part of a 917 society. Our common ground that is to put the uh, US Constitution back in the hands of eighth grade, to remember the system in America is what protect each of our rights. A member of the Bethel Church under the leadership of Pastor James, Pastor Rice Brooks. Even though we have 70 countries represented, Carlos, our member of our church. Thank you for coming, Carlos. And uh, Pastor Ron Luis, as I said, from New York, is part of this church system, every nation. And our common ground there, it doesn't matter what country you're from, we all are Christians. I'm a member of the Living Sand Ministry and uh, to apply scripture Monday through Friday. And people say there's no common ground between people who have faith and people who don't have faith. Is that true? For example, many years ago, I want to pray with my patients, but they say, oh, don't. If you pray, your non-Christian patient will never come back. I got worried, so I didn't want there to pray. pray. Then I asked the Living Center Ministry leaders, I said, well, they said, well, it's the right thing to do. There's a price to pay. So I said, okay, I'm going to pray. I really want to get the best outcome for my patient. I want to focus 100%. I want to be distracted by everything else in the operating room. So I start praying with my patients. But um, I was told that I'm supposed to be politically correct, so I'm supposed to ask for permission before I pray. But think about this. If you're underneath my surgical laser, <laughs> and I'm all look over over you, I say, Mr. Johnson, is that OK to pray? You may not dare to say no. <laughs> but I kind of took advantage of the situation. <laughs> but I get a, about 100 non-Christian patients over the course of period of time, and I asked them the question, I said, were you, were you offended? Because remember, people said, between people with faith and no faith has no common ground. It's up to me, I want to pray, if up to him or her, he or she would not want to pray. Is it true? We have no common ground. So I get about 100 of them and ask them, each of them, day after. I said, were you offended? Yesterday I prayed. So the interaction goes like this, most of them. They say, Dr. Wayne, Yes, I, I don't believe what you believe. I said, I know, I know that. That's why I ask you. They said, well, you did ask me for permission, but I was underneath your laser. I didn't dare to say no. <laughs> I said, I know that. But I want to know, were you offended? What they told me, stay with me to this day. They said, Dr. Wang, not only I was not offended, I was moved. I said, how would you be moved when you don't believe what I believe? They say, the reason I was moved when you prayed with me yesterday was because in one, one of my most important moments, which is my eye surgery, I didn't want anything to go wrong. You brought something which is important to you. Your faith. I appreciate that. At the moment, I realized that it's the love for fellow human being that transcends the boundary of faith and religion. It's the love for fellow human being that is our common ground. And the American Project, through the Teaching of American Revolution, we put the Bible in the hands of students, and with Diane Canada, Lady of America, to encourage the ladies to study how to use the common ground approach to find common ground. China, is there a common ground? As I said, Humanistically, it's important to know our different culture and uh, people. 
throughout the world as part of the humanity. Economically, in order for America to survive, we need to have a good relationship with the country we owe the most money to and the world's second largest economy, a country that we have done a horrible job in selling our product to. We keep on buying from China. A company will not survive if you keep on buying and cannot sell. A nation cannot survive if you keep on buying without being able to sell. And number three is our precious freedom and democracy. We want to preserve that to help more people around the world. We have to fight the autocracy. And last thing you want to see is United Russia and China front. You see the three reasons we need to improve the relations between the United States and China? I'm going to talk about the common ground between the United States and China in various different aspects from history, culture, people, religion, and uh, sports and food, different aspects. History. China in America has a wonderful history of helping each other. In the uh, late 19th century, there was this Marx Rebellion. A bunch of farmers up, had the uprising, and the government had to push it, uh, crush it down and had to get help from different nations. And then when it came the time for the Chinese government to pay back all these different countries, you know, England, France, and different countries that helped the Chinese emperor put down the uprising, America did something unique. American government said, you don't need to pay us. The money that you plan to pay us to help you crush down the uprising, why don't you use the money to send students to America? That resulted in the first group of Chinese students came overseas to study America, which then resulted in the next few decades, six or seven Nobel Prize winners. So China and America has this historical collaborative spirit. 1972, a Chinese ping pong player arrived in America. We showed the Americans how to play. You know, Americans are good with big balls, right? Football, basketball. Chinese are good with little balls. And uh, it's a wonderful collaborative. I mean, in this uh, recent uh, Olympics, for example, there is a U.S.-China combined team. That's wonderful. Culture. Every city you go in America, there's a Chinatown. And um, it's, it's always the highlight of the city, whether it's San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, that people come to the city to visit. It represents the cultural diversity, ethnic uniqueness, and the beauty of this country, of the city. And that because America is a country that allows the flourishing of, you know, different culture, particularly Chinese culture. People. You know, it's interesting that different country has uh, people have different characteristics, attributes, right? Talking about the French. French is very artistic. Nose very high. In in France, if you don't speak French, they don't speak to you. Italians, passion. Oh, you know, Ariel, opera. And the uh, Russians, Tchaikovsky, Nureyev, Mihaila Baryshnikov. I mean, Russians are superb in what they do. They feel deeper. And for some reason, when I look at Russian art, Lots of them are sad, <laughs> very sad. The Russian has deep emotions. So they get into the depth of human feeling. But Chinese and Americans have one common attribute. We are all pragmatic people. We won't get things done. We are not loud. We just want to get things done, practical. I mean, to have a loud and uh, fat Chinese student probably is not very common, right? Usually quiet and how to study. Because Chinese uh, culture encourages, you know, you do your best job yourself, be quiet. And Americans, we, I think, 
a similar, we're not as loud as Italians or other, we want to get things done pragmatically. Custom. And many different customs, and America has our uh, customs, and we treasure it, like football. First time I saw football when I came from China, what amazes me that it may not mean anything to you as a well, I will take for, you know, that's the way it is. But to me, it was shocking when I watched football. You know why? American football. First of all, the foot is not involved, <laughs> which I don't understand why it's called football. And second, the sport literally every five seconds stops. I've never seen a spot that stop every five seconds. It's going. It's like, why people just keep on relying themselves to keep on going? So, but we as Americans, we love it as football, and uh, you know, we think we're the best. First time I see uh, so World Series, I said, "That's a World Championship? No, that's American Baseball Championship." I said, "Why is it World Series?" <laughs> And they say, oh, we're the best. That's why we're World Series. Um, Chinese um, have similar sort of a temperament. You know, the, you know what the word China means in Mandarin? It means the center of the world. <laughs> the word China means the center of the world. Food. Um, we will love Chinese food and just great varieties. And you may not know that most of Chinese food in America come from central part of China, Sichuan or Guangdong. There's only a few percent of the Chinese food variety of cuisine. China has 50 different spoken languages and 250 different, no, 50 different written languages and 250 different spoken languages. It's a vast country. We love the uh, takeouts and, you know, America has embraced China, Chinese food, wholeheartedly. Economy. We got to be smart. We need to recognize that China is developing explosively. That when I came to this country in 1982, compared with now, 40 years later, do you know what's the increasing average salary in China? from 1982 to now, 40 years later. But what do you think is the increasing average salary in the United States in the last 40 years? Let's say a teacher made uh, $25,000 a year in 1982. What do you say, made 40,000, 45,000? So not double, no, not quite double, right? So maybe 60, 70% increase in average salary. But you know how much increase in the last same period, 1982 to 22, in China, the average salary increase is not 60%, 70%, it's not 100%, it's not 200%, it's not 300%, it's not 500%, it's 1,000%. That's equivalent to say 25, uh, 40 years ago, a teacher in America made $25,000 a year, now it's making $250,000 a year. If, if that's the case, we're, we're, the economy is doing great. <laughs> Our living standards really increase, but that's what happened in China. Never in the history of humankind, such significant human development happened in such a speed, with such a speed in such a short period of time. China almost has single-handedly taken a quarter of human race out of poverty. You, you might have read the book, uh, Tom Freeman, New York Times reporter, World is Flat. It basically says that it used to be whether you get to make a product depends what country you're from, privileged few, and uh, what your you know heritage lineage is. No, today whether you get get to make a product depends less on who you are where you're from, but more on what kind of product you can make at what cost. So in that sense, the playing field is level, the world is flat. In the flat world, we need to recognize. We need to learn from the rest of the world. The time has passed when the United States, we, everything we do is better. Today, more and more things are done by others outside the United States are done better, faster than us. I've been traveling back to China almost yearly basis in the last five to six years that when I pull out my wallet in China, people look at me strange. They say, what's that? I said, that's my wallet. 
They no longer have wallet. They just use cell phone. No IDs, no cash. And I say, how do you protect yourself? They say, iris recognition. Think about it. Expose the development. We need to learn from China and the, we need to be able to sell our product to China. Religion. Um, the dominant uh, religion in China is atheist. Most people don't believe a uh, faith of religion. Uh, followed by Buddhism, uh, Taoism, uh, Islam, Christian. But people in China as well are very spiritual. The, the teaching of Confucius, the living principles, moral standards, very much like America. So let me kind of uh, give you a landscape over uh, view of China, the People's Republic of China. On the left upper is Tibet, on the right upper is the Terracotta, the first emperor of China, 30 years before he passed away. He engineered, uh, he motiv mo mobilized one third of the nation to build 7,000 clay soldiers, each with different facial expression, so that when he died, these soldiers can be buried together with him to protect him after death. But you can imagine, was, wasn't he surprised after he died that nobody came to protect him? And the clay soldiers lying undiscovered on the ground for 2,000 years. Terracotta soldiers. Forbidden city, lower left, Beijing, all built for one man, the emperor. And the Great Wall is one of the four uh, human, humanly constructed structure visible from a spaceship. China borders different countries. Uh, the Far East is becoming more and more important on the geopolitical landscape in the world today. Um, by the way, um, I have here a book by my dear friend Susan Hunter. Susan is in the audience, I invite her, yes. And it's called 77 Letters, Operation Moral Booster, Vietnam. You know, we all learn about a war like Vietnam from American perspective. But Susan's book explores the war from Vietnamese perspective as well, from our veterans, from the American perspective, and also from people in Vietnam. And that's where we need to look through all of our the conflict is from both sides, to try to find that common ground, whether you're Vietnamese or you're American, veteran or soldier, at the end, we all want to be happy and peaceful. So that's Susan's book that I want to give a plug about. I think we need to look at what we have suffered. So Vietnam is in the south, bordering China. And uh, these are different countries. The center of gravity of world economy has moved out of the United States now the center of world economy. Population, uh, China has about 1.4 billion people. It's interesting, somebody did a um, computer simulation of the face of the world. And um, they put in a different countries, people, facial characteristics into a computer based on the population percentage and come up with the face of humankind. But that face of humankind looks suspiciously like a Chinese. Um, in terms of religion, Buddhism is leading one, Taoism, Islam, Catholicism, and Protestant tradition. Um, many interesting facts in terms of agriculture and just huge diversity. Dynasty has been sort of uh, the dominant mode of passing generation to generation. You know, um, America as a nation, we have what, 200 some years? for some years that China has 5,000 years. This is almost like an old man compared with a teenager. Teenager has the positive energy, the unbridled optimism, but the old man may have some wisdom <laughs> because he had been there, suffered. These are different dynasties. And these are Nobel Prize winners of, from China, Chinese origin. These are famous people. From China. I'll give you a story that I did the LASIK surgery on uh, Dolly Parton. And then 
her husband, Cao Jing Kim. <laughs> Cao, it's interesting, he's a quiet country boy, and nobody paid too much attention to him, always his more, much more famous wife. So I did surgery on Cao, went well, and I said, Cao, we want to video you. He said, me? I said, yeah. So we put a video all together under the light, and Cao looked around. Are you all ready? I said, yes. Cao, say something. How would you feel about eye surgery? And he apparently was, looks like not very accustomed to all the attention on him. He said, I am, uh, okay, I am Cao Ding. I'm not just, not just somebody's husband. I'm Cao Ding. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wang did my eye surgery. And he's a rural country boy from rural Tennessee. And uh, he looked into the video, how did, he said, do you know who Dr. Wang is? And I could tell that he was in his mind trying to see, you know, what other Chinese that he knows as a country boy <laughs> in the rural Tennessee. He said, Dr. Wang is the cousin of Jackie Chan. <laughs> he doesn't know that many other Chinese. Jackie Chan is one. He does know. Actually, speaking of Dolly, I have an interesting experience East and West as well. One day, Dolly came in. She said, Dr. Wang, I'm not here for my eyes. I did her eye surgery, went well, and I said, what are you here for? She said, I'm here to play music with you. I said, you? Music with me? <laughs> You're a country legend? I'm what I call myself a closet musician. I play, sing songs in showers. <laughs> And she said, yes, you play this Chinese arhu, violin. I'm thinking about East-West experiment. I said, okay, what's your idea? She said, come to my studio. So she introduced me to this studio in Music Row. And I walk in a big room like this, thousands of buttons. I've never seen a room with all these buttons. And she said, okay, have a seat, Dr. Wang. And she said, my idea is that I'm going to sing an American country song. And you play with your Chinese violin or who to accompany it. So, oh, that's interesting. Then she had uh, me listen to a recording a country song called The Cruel War about American Civil War, where the young lady wants to go to the front, but her husband said, no, 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 ladies are not allowed in the front. Keep on saying no, the whole song. At the end, he said yes. So I listened to Dolly's song, and afterwards she said, are you ready? I said, yes, I have my arahu ready, the sound engineer, everything. I said, oh, you have a score for me? She said, I have no score. I have no idea what arahu should sound like. I said, do you have a score for, of your song? I just heard. She said, no, I have no score. I just remember that song. So I said, you really want me to compose? <laughs> she said, yeah, that's right. We're going to do it together. So it's a little table like this. She sat right here. And I was my Chinese violin. And we listened to her song and stopped, have her sing it back to me. And I can experiment with another friend, Tom, sitting there, trans, you know, transcriber. And so we, we play a little bit. Mm, yeah. We're trying to imagine what it feel like a Chinese instrument or who will uh, be like accompany a country Western song. But we realized it was a very special moment because we are creating something remarkable, an East and West collaboration. At the end of the night, we composed, I played, the engineer recorded, we're done. And it's in the store, it's one of Dolly's CDs for those of the, uh, the days. And you see the list of musicians, you know, uh, Dolly Parton, Alison Cross, Vincent Gill, the, the, the Ming Wang. So who is that? <laughs> Nobody knows that, but I'm part of that. But the point is, East and West, we experiment. It's fun. Uh, as I said, the Chinese food in America you're tasting is really only a small part of a Chinese food because that's a Sichuan southern part of the country. Art, wide variety. Tremendous. We know the Great War was built over 2,000 years ago. And the Great War, you take the brick, connect them together, you can go to the moon and the back seven times. Forbidden City, Peking Opera, is um, 
I used to think Peking opera is very different from Western opera, but today I realize they're very much the same because it's all about depth of human feeling. This is a melodramatic, I mean, think of La Traviata, Carmen. You know, it's all about the depth of human feeling. In that way, it's very similar to a Peking opera. Dragon is a fabled animal in Chinese culture. Sound dial was invented by ancient Chinese to tell the time of the day. In the southern part of China, it's a very peaceful country, country that many poets wrote beautiful poems. Panda is the national animal. And the uh, terracotta soldier I mentioned, the red color is national color. Chinese economy is exploding, is exploding. In America, we measure our national economic growth, or company growth by 5, 10, 15%. China's measured by 50, 100, 200% annually. This is a picture of Shanghai. It's interesting that when night comes, we go home here in America, six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, the life just starts. Every air molecule seems filled with entrepreneur spirit. People are hungry. People want to create and want to work hard, make something of themselves. Why China matter? China is US number one creditor, I mentioned. China has surpassed Japan and become the world's number two economy, economic power. China is the world's number one trading, trading nation, which is summation of import and export, over $5 trillion a year. We need to reverse the job loss to China because we are buying so much more, $400 billion a year, than selling to China by encouraging Chinese companies to move here, like Japanese automobile companies. I'm part of the Tennessee China Chamber of Commerce, Tennessee Immigrant Minority Business School. Our COO, John Mickner, yes, our leader there. John, thank you for coming. And uh, it's trying to encourage different cultures learn from each other how to learn, for example, China, how to sell our product to China, and also how to encourage Chinese firms to move in the United States to create a job here. What do we have to offer Tennesseans? I think we have three things, healthcare, music, and religion. So just to give you a sense of foreign investment in Tennessee, there are almost thousands of foreign-based companies and $33 billion capital invested and 123,000 people. So um, it's a tremendous, it's really help our economy by having these companies that are moving their manufacturing firms to America to create a job here. That's how you can reverse the job loss. Through common ground seeking, understand people, culture, history of the nation, believe in shared humanity. As I said, you, uh, if you're interested in a uh, common ground Bible study or my autobiography, I'll be delighted to actually on your table there. You, you can come to me. The Bible study is uh, $5 and the biography, which is being made to the film, is $10. Both goes to the foundation. I'll be I, Just bring the book to me at the door. I'll be happy to autograph for you. The film will be released later this year. By the way, I'm inviting some friends. If you're interested to have a private viewing, let me know. So in conclusion, I'm very appreciative of Professor Daniel Smith for Political Economy Research Institute of MTSU. You and I appreciate Brian for your help, Brian Delaney. I think what you're doing at PERI is visionary is to, in, in the academic setting, with freedom of searching, ask questions, encourages students and faculties. In the very, very polarized world, to encourage all of us to find that common ground. Whether it's a common ground domestically, between races, ethnicities, and political spectrums, but also internationally, that the name Political Economy Research Institute is to seek that common ground we all share as humankind. That we need to broaden, that PRI is broadening our scope of understanding of the rest of the world. And this lecture series that Professor Daniel Smith suggested to me, and I said, I'll be happy to help fund it. Uh, Professor, you bring those speakers, you know, from around the country, from other parts of the world who share with different viewpoints. 
I remember a recent speaker from uh, Brian talk about why immigration is a good thing and talk about the housing issues in America. So I think we all need more information, more education. It is the respect for facts and the information is our common ground. It's the respect for this country, the people, that should be more important than any political party. That's our common ground. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come to share my topic. My take home message is let's study China, both from human humanity standpoint and from ne economic necessity for us as Americans to survive, to be able to sell to the rest of the world, and finally, from democracy standpoint to build a relationship with China so we can prevent a Russia-China alliances, which would not be good. I'll be happy to present this uh, talk to any organization that you think might be interested, because I think as an immigrant, it's my duty to share my viewpoint, have living on both sides of the world, autocracy, democracy, and to express my appreciation to this country and remind all of us we need to appreciate so much more. Finally, you say, okay, Ming, good talk. What is one thing I need to do, taking home? Next time you meet someone who has different opinions, different viewpoints, whether it's another person, another country, rather than shouting and yelling, can we separate position from person? Can we recognize our shared humanity? All people, we all desire peace, security, and love. Let's be more willing to look at what we all have in common rather than being so fixated on our differences. Thank you.